You're listening to On Shifting Ground from World Affairs and KQED. I'm Ray Suarez. The Northern Ireland conflict, often known as the Troubles, was a 30-year fight between the overwhelmingly Protestant Unionists, who wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, and the largely Roman Catholic Nationalists, who want Northern Ireland to become part of the Republic of Ireland. Between 1968 and 1998, families were ripped apart by borders and bombs. In the three decades of violence, 3,600 people were killed, 30,000 were wounded. After months of negotiation, another breakthrough was announced in the Northern Ireland peace process. That's me reporting for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer in 1999. What does an outsider pick up when covering a story like this one? Well, they were physical things. Walls that marched through the middle of neighborhoods, murals of mourned martyrs announcing a neighborhood's allegiance to one side or another in the bloodletting. What you found in people, all kinds of people, was the tension that comes from an almost unbearable mix of pride, frustration, anger, sadness, and resignation. Along with the grievance and the loss, the worry about what happens next, it was the sometimes unbearable feeling that it wasn't ever going to end. That lasted until the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland signed a peace deal in 1998. But if the focus on these islands remains in the past, the past will become the future. And that is something no one desires. Known as the Good Friday Agreement, the pact gave people in Northern Ireland the choice of citizenship in the UK, Ireland, or both. And it made the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland all but invisible. One of the key players in the agreement was Jonathan Powell. He was UK Prime Minister Tony Blair's chief negotiator for the Good Friday Talks, which started in 1997. In Foreign Policy's acclaimed podcast, The Negotiators, hosted by Jen Williams, the team recently spoke with Powell about how the agreement was just the beginning in setting a foundation for peace. The Northern Ireland negotiations were complicated, with lots of factions and many conflicting interests. Powell came to the table with leaders from the pro-UK unionists and the nationalists mainly represented by the political group Sinn Féin. The unionist leader was David Trimble, and Sinn Féin was led by Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, and they'll be discussed in Powell's story. Powell told his story to Foreign Policy's senior producer, Laura Rosborough Tellum. I became the chief negotiator in Northern Ireland largely by accident. Essentially, it was because I knew the unionists quite well. I had been at the British Embassy in Washington, and one of my jobs there was to look after the unionist politicians when they started coming over in the 1990s. They gradually started coming to Washington, trying to see the administration, going up on the hill. And to be honest, the reception they got on the hill was not all that friendly from Irish-American congressmen. So my job was to go up and try and help defend them. So they came to trust me a bit. And then when we started in government and started the negotiations, my job for Tony was to try and initially to carry the unionists with us, to go and talk to them and carry them along. And once I started doing that, then I ended up having to do it also with Sinn Féin and the Republicans and other Catholic parties. So it was largely by accident. Normally, the chief of staff in Downing Street, a job I actually created because it didn't exist before, would not have been doing this kind of thing. But because Tony Blair cared so much about Northern Ireland and devoted so much political capital to it, he asked me to take it on. And it was difficult to manage being chief of staff at the same time as doing Northern Ireland negotiations. But it was about Tony Blair's commitment to making peace in Northern Ireland. So Tony Blair set a deadline of one year from coming into office from when he wanted to get to an agreement. We were determined to get IRA back on ceasefire again and then get them into talks very quickly. And the civil servants, the officials, often tried to persuade him to change that. He said, it's very dangerous to have a deadline like that. What if the deadline isn't met? What if it collapses? The whole thing will be over. But he was determined and he stuck to it after we'd come to office. I think that probably late 70s British Army realised they could contain the IRA forever, but they weren't going to defeat them militarily. And that is a uh, what the academics call a perceived mutually hurting stalemate. I think mid-1980s, Adams and McGuinness, who were past fighting age by that stage, 
could see this could go on forever, that they were never going to win militarily. They're never going to be defeated, but they're never going to win militarily. That's when they started reaching out to the British government, but first the Irish government, and even before that, John Hume, who deserves great credit for talking to Jerry Adams. So I think that perceived mutually hurting stalemate was the fundamental thing. That's what motivated Adams and McGuinness to try and lead the movement into a peace agreement, which was contrary to their constitution, because the IRA constitution says they should keep their weapons until there's United Ireland. They didn't do that in the end in, in this agreement. And this remarkable act of leadership by Adams McGuinness to get them into that position through the agreement. So I think things like power sharing were crucially important to the Catholic population as a whole. And the right thing to do, because you can't just govern a place like that with just one sect, one, one religion governing the whole thing. Jay Adams and Martin McGuinness were, were complicated people. The first time I met them in uh, October 1997, I refused to shake their hands. Tony Blair was more sensible, he did shake their hands, although he then faced a protest for having done so. But you know, the IRA had shot my father during the 1940s and injured him. They'd put my brother, who worked for Mrs. Thatcher, on a death list for eight years. I didn't feel very warm and cuddly. Funnily enough, I then got a call from Martin McGuinness not long after that, asking me to visit Derry to see him uh, incognito, not to tell the securocrats, the police and the army. So I asked Tony Blair, should I do it? And he said, yeah, you're expendable, why not? Off you go. So I took a plane to Belfast and a taxi to Derry and stood on a street corner feeling rather foolish until two guys with shaved heads turned up and pushed me into the back of a taxi. They drove me around for about an hour till I was completely lost. Stopped outside a little modern house on the edge of an estate and pushed me out. Knocked on the door. Martin McGuinness answered on crutches, making a very unfunny joke about kneecapping, which was the IRA way of punishing people by drilling holes in their knees, ankles and uh, elbows. Um, I spent three hours with him. We didn't make any breakthroughs, but he understood finally that to end a war like this, you have to build trust. And building trust means taking shared risks, going onto their territory, not just expecting them to come to Number 10 Downing Street, expecting them to come to castles in Stormont. So I got to know them quite well over that time. And they were very good negotiators. I mean, you know, they'd seen nine prime ministers come and go before Tony Blair while well, they'd been leaders of the Republican movement. So they were very experienced. And they divided the roles between them. There was a certain amount of good cop and bad cop. You know, Jerry Adams was the harder guy and Martin McGuinness was the more pleasant uh, guy, although he'd probably kill more people with his own hands. Negotiating with them was difficult. You know, they would, they would give me a very hard time. There's one occasion I remember negotiating with them in uh, West Belfast where it'd been a really hard day and they'd been really giving me a hard time. And Jerry Adams leaned across the table and said, the thing I like about you, Jonathan, is that when you lie, you blush. And my Northern Ireland office colleague sitting next to me immediately leaned back across the table and said, unlike you, Jerry. And that's true. I, you know, I think the way I managed to win them over was by being very straightforward, trying to be as honest as I could be about what we could do and what we couldn't do. But they were both from underground movement. They were used to keeping secrets and not revealing their hands. So I was negotiating with a very different uh, set of people. If I look back at it, in the first meeting we had with Adams and McGuinness in Downing Street in December 1997. At the end of the meeting, um, Jerry Adams took Tony Blair and me to the end of a room, the cabinet room, which is separated off by some pillars so other people can't necessarily hear what you're saying. And he said that conceivably he could take the IRA into an agreement very quickly, but he would only take part of the IRA. And if he wanted to take the whole IRA, he needed time and space. And essentially the gamble that Tony Blair took was to give the time and space for that to happen, to move gradually to getting to peace. And that's why it took so long, which David Trimble used to complain about, why were we giving them so much time? But I think that was the only way to make a lasting peace. David Trimble, who was the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, the moderate Protestant party, David Trimble was a very unusual character for a politician. He was an intellectual. He'd been a law professor at Queen's University in Belfast. He'd actually been a radical as a young politician. He'd helped bring down the moderate unionist government at the time of the Sunningdale Agreement in 1973, the last time there'd been an agreement with the parties in Northern Ireland. He, as a radical unionist, had helped defeat the moderate unionist leader. And he could be very difficult, and he was very bad as a politician, either at communicating to his public or at carrying his people with him uh, inside his party. So we had this agreement on a document called the Heads of Agreement. Heads of Agreement was something we agreed in February 1998, which was 
if you like, a framework agreement for the Good Friday Agreement. It's quite short, but what it did was it ruled out all those things we were not going to negotiate about. We weren't going to negotiate about a united Ireland. That wasn't included in the heads of agreement. And that took a very difficult negotiation. And I got David Trimble to an agreement on Sunday night. Finally, he'd agreed to something and I'd sent it to him overnight. I went to bed having made, I calculated 120 phone calls in the course of Sunday. And I thought, this is pretty fragile, but I hope it's going to stay. The next morning, I was woken up by David calling me in tears, saying he tried to sell the document to his colleagues because he'd not discussed the document with his colleagues in the process. And um, they'd all said no. And so he was going to have to reject the agreement that he'd already signed. So I had to then start rushing around and cobble together another agreement that we managed to get us through. So he was both actually a very brave man, particularly when it came to Good Friday Agreement and subsequently. But he was also quite difficult to negotiate with because he wasn't a traditional leader. Uh, But in the end, I grew to be very fond of him and thought that he was a brave man who did manage to deliver his party and his people into peace. When we got to the eve of the Good Friday Agreement, George Mitchell had presided over the document on the the internal issues, the first strand. Not that it had made much progress, but there was something to write down. But the North-South had to be agreed in the end between the two governments. And so George Mitchell was waiting for us to conclude that, and that was going to cover the North-South bodies. And my colleague John Holmes, uh, who had been John Major's uh, Foreign Affairs Private Secretary and stayed with us, was a very good guy. He negotiated with his Irish opposite number the document for this. And the Irish, of course, because they were being asked to give up a lot, they were being asked to give up their constitutional claim on Northern Ireland, amongst other things, needed to show they'd achieved something and wanted to show that they had got a lot of North-South bodies. They got some shared sovereignty, because that's what they really wanted. And what we ended up doing was conceding a lot of those bodies, because we knew they didn't have great meaning, because they were literally on technocratic things like water, management. But what we hadn't thought about, I think, sufficiently, was how that would look optically to the unionists. So when we finally gave that agreement to George Mitchell and he published it, John Taylor, the deputy leader of the unionist party, the one who'd lost the leadership to David Trimble, came out and said he wouldn't touch it with a 60-foot barge pole. And so when we went flying over to start the Good Friday negotiations, George Mitchell actually said to Tony Blair, I don't know why you've come, there's no chance of an agreement. You're listening to On Shifting Ground, produced by World Affairs in San Francisco. This week, we're sharing an episode from the new season of The Negotiators from Foreign Policy. It's hosted by Jen Williams. Before the break, U.S. Senator George Mitchell, chairing the talks, thought there was no chance of getting to an agreement. The chief negotiator for U.K. Prime Minister Tony Blair, Jonathan Powell, picks it up from there. We realised we had a really big problem with the UUP, with the Ulster Unionist Party. They couldn't actually address this agreement because of the optics of this annex with tens of pages of North-South bodies. It looked like they were giving up British sovereignty. So we had to sort that problem out first. And we were saved in that by Bertie Ahern, the Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister. He actually, his mother had just died just as we were starting the talks. So he very kindly flew up after sitting through her wake and Tony Blair sat down with him and told him, look, we're going to have to reduce what you've managed to get us to give you. We're going to have to row back from that long list of North-South bodies if we're going to get any chance of starting this negotiation. And Bertie, to his credit, agreed that his team should work on that and he went back to Dublin for his mother's actual funeral and then came back again for the Good Friday negotiations. His officials were not very keen on negotiating a reduced list. So actually, in the end, he had to do it when he came back. But that was a big political step because he was taking a real risk politically at home, coming from the party that was a Republican party that believed in a united Ireland to give up what it had gained was a big concession. But if he hadn't done that, there would have been no Good Friday negotiation. In the actual Good Friday negotiations, really, looking back at it, it's remarkable how little of a role Sinn Féin played. For example, the power-sharing provisions, which were very similar to the provisions in the 1973 Sunningdale Agreement, 
were actually agreed by the SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party very quickly. They agreed them in a matter of hours and Sinn Féin wasn't really involved. John Hume went to tell Sinn Féin what he'd agreed. Uh, Sinn Féin tried to reassert that a few times by going out to brief the press they weren't going to sign up to an agreement, which got everyone nervous. And as a result, people paid more attention to them. Bertie Ahern spent a long time talking to them. They came up at one stage with a list of, I think it was 40 demands they had on changes. And Mo Molum and Bertie Ahern went through the night talking to them, going through changes one by one. The one change that Adams absolutely insisted on was prisoner release. And we, on our side, hadn't really thought about prisoner release very much. It had been handled by the Northern Ireland office and we hadn't really focused on the consequences. So it came as a bit of a shock to us when Mo Molum told us that actually, as part of this agreement, we we're going to have to release hardened terrorists after just two years. Even if they killed someone, they got out after just two years. So we were a little bit shocked about that. And then Jerry Adams came to see Tony Blair and asked to see him privately and said he'd need the prisoners to be out in it one year, not two years. And Tony, who was desperate enough to get to an agreement, said, well, we'll think about it, but it'd be very, very hard for us to do this. So I think we'll leave it as two years, but you come back to me if we have to have one year as the only way of moving forward on this. Jerry Adams never called that in, but it would have been a big problem for us because when prisoners were released, it really undermined support for the agreement on the unionist side. But that was the main issue that Adams insisted on. Although I, looking at it in retrospect, I think for him, the most important thing was when Tony Blair said that he would, in response to a question from Adams privately, that he would stay committed on Northern Ireland. He wasn't going to go away. He wasn't going to sign the agreement and then just carry on governing other issues. He was going to stay committed to sorting that out. And I think that was the key thing. Because if you look back at the history of Northern Ireland, the basic problems happen when the British stop paying attention. You know, when we just dismiss it and say it's not our problem, then that's when we have difficulties in Northern Ireland. It's when prime ministers are directly engaged, as Tony Blair was for 10 years, with huge amounts of time, then you have a better chance of solving it and keeping it solved. Some of these negotiations were very sort of uh, bizarre. Like at one stage, the unionists, very late at night, started insisting that there should be a body that was dealing with Ullens. Ullens is a dialect of English used by some Scots in Northern Ireland, and they were demanding equal rights for that with the Irish language, and they tried that on Bertie Ahern with Tony Blair there late at night and nearly came to a punch-up. The problem for David Trimble as leader of the Unionists was he didn't want to share power with a political party, Sinn Féin, with an army behind them, a private army. Uh, so he needed them to give up their weapons. And the problem for us was that he didn't really raise this issue in a big way till very late in the negotiations. But the stage he came to really push on this, we'd already agreed to everything else. And a draft agreement had been circulated to all the parties at the negotiation headquarters in Castle Buildings, this awful, decrepit 1960s building that stank of sweat and stale food and people who hadn't slept for a very long time and people milling around. It was just a very unconducive place to do negotiations. So he came up to us at about sometime after midnight, very late at night, saying he just couldn't see how he could sell this agreement to his party if it didn't have clarity about the IRA giving up its weapons because he couldn't share power unless they gave up weapons. And Tony Blair said to him, look, we can't reopen this agreement now. That would be a whole new chapter. And we could be here a very, very long time if we tried to persuade the IRA at this stage to commit in writing to giving up all its weapons so if you do that, we'd, we'd shoot the whole agreement. And David Trimble went back and said, OK, well, I'll go back and talk to my party. And he went downstairs and he, they had a very big office on the ground floor. And a lot of people in the course of that morning of Good Friday came in from the party. It wasn't just five or six people who had been in the negotiating team. There were tens of people there. And they worked themselves up into a sort of a, a lather about this and other issues. And Tony said to me, like, I don't think he's going to be able to sell this. We're going to have to do something to make sure he gets over the line. And we had with us an official, John Steele, like his name was. He was uh, from Northern Ireland, but he's a unionist. He was in charge of security. And so we started asking him about how this could be expressed. And Tony Blair told me to get my laptop out. And I started typing and he dictated to me with John Steele occasionally correcting it, the terms of a side letter to David Trimble a letter that would actually reassure him on this point of decommissioning weapons by saying that the British government expected the IRA to give up its weapons if there was power sharing. 
So sort of putting ourselves on the side of the unionists and saying that's what we expected to happen out of this agreement. And I typed it up on my laptop, pushed print on it, pulled off the printer and ran downstairs because I knew this argument was running away from us amongst the unionists. And I got down to their office and they had the door locked so no one could come in and lobby them. And they wouldn't let me in. I tried knocking, but they wouldn't let me in. Eventually, I stuck the letter under the door and a young unionist pulled it through and then opened the door and let me in. I took the letter up to where David Trimble was sitting on a, at a table with John Taylor, the two of them, on a slightly raised dais as if, you know, in a school or something, a stage. And I took and gave the letter to David and David started reading it and John Taylor read it over, over his shoulder. And, he, and I heard John Taylor say, we can run with that. So I left the room immediately, went upstairs, told Tony we had agreement. We immediately summoned the plenary before anyone could change their minds and just sort of really uh, railroaded everyone into an agreement before they could think too much about it. And actually, we also brought it to a conclusion very quickly. No one signed anything. Tony Blair and Bertie Hearn went outside, did a press conference, announced the agreement and left uh, before it could be all unraveled. David Trimble went out and did a press conference a little bit later on the steps, but then it started to rain. And the letter, he had the letter and he read it out at his press conference. And it start, the ink started to run. And the only problem was, in my rush, I hadn't saved a copy of this letter. Uh, so we didn't have any means of knowing what we'd originally said. And rather shamefacedly, a few months later, the Northern Ireland office had to approach David Trimble to ask to see a copy of the letter so we could reconstruct what we'd actually promised. And had it disintegrated entirely in the rain, no one would ever have known. Uh, what we promised and that that's the way negotiations work but that was what got him over the hump but it didn't solve the problem because then we had this problem of decommissioning for the years that followed as soon as tony blair and bertie Hearn had done their press conference we rushed to the helicopters that were waiting for us just a very short distance away at uh, stormont castle to take us back to our planes and back to london tony blair had been very worried about this whole negotiation because He'd been supposed to spend Easter with Prime Minister Aznar of Spain in his official residence in the country in Spain. And his uh, wife and mother-in-law had gone ahead of him and he was terrified about what his mother-in-law would be saying to uh, Aznar. So he was very keen to get moving. And we came out of the negotiation, we were just about to get on the helicopter, I got a call from Buckingham Palace, the Queen wanted to speak to Tony, so I put him on the phone to him so he could say a few words. We took off, we were very sort of, uh, full of gallows humour, because we just couldn't believe we'd escaped this nightmare of three days and night without sleep. And basically we had some gallows humour about thinking, thank goodness that's over. But if we thought that we'd solved the problem in Northern Ireland, we were sadly mistaken. The next nine years, because it took us nine years to implement the Good Friday Agreement, I thought, what a waste, why what a shame, why couldn't we just cut to the chase and get it done? But then when you think about things like the Oslo Accords, where you had all the celebration when there was agreement, but no effort to implement it, you understand that people don't trust each other anymore just because you have a piece of paper. In fact, you have a piece of paper because you don't trust each other, but you only begin to trust the other side when they implement what's on the paper. So those nine years weren't wasted. They were actually negotiations to build confidence between the two sides that really do what they said they were going to do. So it was necessary to go through those steps to get to the assembly up and running under uh, Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness in a lasting way. And I think whenever I look at another peace agreement that I'm working on, I always think this implementation phase is really the most important. If you don't have that implementation phase, it's never going to work. The unionists didn't want to go into government with people who were backed by a private army because they were afraid that would be used to, to oppress them. So mate, that was the central issue. But there were other issues. There was the Irish language. Was it really going to be used, encouraged, funded, used sometimes in official uh, functions? There was the issue of the protection of human rights that Catholics in particular wanted for minority rights. There was the issue of policing, which is perhaps the most difficult issue. In the Good Friday Agreement, we couldn't agree what would happen about policing. Policing had been very dominated by Protestants throughout the history. The overwhelming majority of the police force had been Protestant. It had been very biased towards uh, Protestants and wasn't accepted in uh, Republican areas of the country. And no one would give any information to the police. So what we agreed in the Good Friday Agreement was there should be a commission on policing, which was headed by uh, Chris Patton, a conservative minister who was quite popular in Northern Ireland, been a Catholic, was a Catholic, but had been a Tory. 
And he did a very good job. He produced a, um, an excellent uh, outcome to the policing reform. And then the reform was put in place by Hugh Ward, the uh, chief constable, very successfully. But even then, we hadn't solved the problem. And we had a whole series of negotiations at the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, to get uh, Sinn Féin to accept the police, the reform police, and participate in the policing bodies governing it. So there are a whole series of bodies, but at the heart of it was this issue of trust, which was symbolised by the issue of weapons and the IRA not being prepared to give up their weapons. And so that was the problem with the unionists when they saw the IRA not giving up their weapons, uh, but still expecting to be brought into government. That's why the government kept collapsing, because the unionists would pull out uh, or the nationalists would refuse to decommission weapons. And we tried again and again different schemes but none of it solved the problem until we got right through to 2005, when in the end, Jerry Adams, the leader of Sinn Féin, appealed to the IRA to give up their weapons, not to the British, not to the Unionists, but to him you know, as leader. They should give up their weapons so they could make peace. And that was when it really, we had the final breakthrough, when you got the agreement implemented. I spend my time now, all my time, working armed conflicts around the world, which are, of course, very different from Northern Ireland. But I think there are two things I take away in particular from Northern Ireland, as well as many technical lessons that are useful, even if the conflicts are different. One is that there is no such thing as an insoluble conflict. After we signed the Good Friday Agreement, people said, well, there was always going to be peace in Northern Ireland because of the economic change. You know, the Republic of Ireland got richer. Islamic terrorism came along and made... Republican terrorism seemed less terrifying. That's completely wrong. It only happened because there were leaders on both sides who were prepared to take risks, who were patient, who kept at it. So it's really important people understand everywhere that their conflict may be unique, it may be particularly visceral, but it's soluble if they put their minds to it. But it won't get solved by itself. It'll only get solved if there are people who are brave enough to make peace, because making peace is a hell of a lot harder for a politician than making war. And it's a hell of a lot more difficult to sell it to your population. And that's what I would love to see, is people having that bravery in all sorts of conflicts around the world. That was Jonathan Powell, UK Prime Minister Tony Blair's chief negotiator for the Good Friday Agreement. To hear more of Season 3 of The Negotiators from Foreign Policy and Doha Debates, find the show wherever you get your podcasts. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was mixed and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is CEO of World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.